Thank you for checking out our YouTube channel. This message is for you because you matter to us. I'm Megan Brusicki, co-senior pastor of Community Church, and you're about to hear the truth of God's word in an encouraging way with practical steps to help you move forward. In fact, just by watching right now, you're on the path to living fully alive, and we wanna help you. Check out community.church to experience a service live online or to get more info, or come join us at one of our locations. We'll save you a seat. Enjoy today's message. This weekend, I, uh, I'm really pumped about a lot of, I'm pumped up just in general because I got an extra hour of sleep. Come on, how you got an extra hour of sleep? Last night, my, my, my three-year-old didn't wake me up till 5.04 a.m. Come on, because to him it was still 6.04. And uh, we still love him and we still take care of him in Jesus' name. But I'm really excited and, uh, and, and I, I, I feel like sometimes we can wonder in life, what, what, does it really, what does it really look like or what does it really mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? What is it really, what, what, do, what am I really like? And so today, th- that's, what, that's what I wanna ultimately teach all of us. So why don't you look at the person next to you and say, today, you're gonna find out what I'm like. Come on, how many of you are a little nervous? A little nervous right now? Like, and, uh, you know, I feel like if, if two single people are sitting by each other, that could either be good or creepy. It just really depends. I don't really know how that flows, but, but I believe that God has us moving forward, and I wanna remind us of some of why we believe that. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39 says, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and preserve their souls. We, we, we are not a people who, when things get tough, we shrink back. We are not a people as followers of Jesus and as the local church who, when we are not sure what's gonna happen, we shrink back. No, we are a people who move forward by and with faith. So what is this faith? Faith is this word that if we're not careful, we won't really understand what it means. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse one, it defines faith for us like this. Faith is confidence in what we hope for. It is assurance about what we do not see. Now when he says see, he's talking about in the natural. Right, what, what I actually, when I look out, I, 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 I see, I mean, mainly I just see lights and some blinding right now, but like when you look out, right, what you see, that, that's not what he, he, he's talking about. No, faith is that I hope for what I, I see in the, na- in, the, in the spiritual, what I do not see in the natural. Faith is that I actually believe what God has put in my heart, that I actually believe that what I've read in, the, in God's word, that I actually believe in some of those promises of God. I can see them right here. I don't see them in the natural, but I see them. This is faith. See, this is what you and I need so that we will face forward and keep going forward in our life. Because all of us are gonna have these moments, right, where we will start to just kind of look in the natural circumstances of the moment, and if I'm not facing forward, I'll get caught up. I'll get hung up in that moment. And so Hebrews chapter 11 goes on to talk about some what we call faith heroes and what they did and how they were living their life. Uh, if you've read your Bible before, these are some of the men and women that, I mean, God, God just miraculously um, used their life for good, and yet they had to continually face forward. It says this about a few of them in verse 24. It says, it was by faith Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose, he chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. He was looking ahead. I think that you and I get frustrated in life when we stop looking ahead. I think that if we were willing to be really, really real, like whatever you're, Thoughts about heaven have ever been in your life. In this moment, I wanna say to you, we get frustrated when we try to make this heaven. When we try to set up a life right now that is absolutely perfect and thinking it can be achieved. And we're constantly then frustrated because listen, this is earth. It's not supposed to be heaven. No, we're supposed to keep looking forward, facing forward, and that's how we have strength. I remember my grandma, my grandma Brusicki, she was a little, she was a little old lady. She wasn't always a little old lady. She was a little young lady at one point. But I remember, like, you know, I'm like six, I'm like six foot three, used to be six foot four, but I'm not sure what happened, but now I'm six foot three. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like grandma was probably about four foot 10. 
And, and, and I remember, I remember especially towards the end of her life when grandma wasn't healthy, she, she had this, I mean, she had, she, it's like she could just see heaven. She had this, this image looking forward and she would sometimes get tears in her eyes and they would roll down her cheeks when she was like, it's heaven's gonna be so awesome. I just can't wait to get there. It's gonna be so great. And I'm, I wonder sometimes, do, do, we, do we live like that? Or do we live frustrated because this isn't? And are we not facing forward and the significance we should have to make a difference. Because when we're facing this life of eternity that God would have for us, that is how we ultimately have greatest impact on the earth today. That's why the writer of Hebrews tells us about a couple other people that didn't experience the fullness on the earth, but, but move forward by faith. He says this in verse 30, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. We're gonna talk about Joshua in just a moment. It says in verse 31, by faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Now, this is the reason I'm using this verse today, and this is the reason I think that God let it be in the scriptures for us. Hebrews chapter 11, like faith hall of fame, these men and women who did great things of God, he chooses this one person to call out their occupation. Rahab the prostitute. Why is that significant for our life? Because I believe that God wanted us to be very clear that we can be completely set free from the sins and the bad choices of our past and that he will not use those to hold us down and to keep us back, but he will use us to move his purpose and his plan forward in the earth today. Like, I'm not gonna live my life and I don't want you to live your life and we're not gonna be a church where we're, where we're gonna say, you know what, if people out there think that I can't be forgiven, then that's their own problem. I know what God says. And I know that God still has purpose for my life. Listen, I know that God still has so much purpose for Hampton Roads and beyond. I know that you and I right now, the reason you are here, like the reason you're breathing on the earth today is for the purpose of others to be fulfilled because that is ultimately how you fulfill your purpose. And so he's like, listen, it's by faith you do it. You gotta keep looking forward. You gotta keep moving forward. So for us as a church, we kind of set Joshua chapter one as our baseline for this. Joshua chapter one in the, in the scriptures of the Old Testament is, God talking to this guy, Joshua, and his people about kind of moving forward into the things he has for him. And for us, several years ago, we kind of clung on to this and felt like the Lord was declaring over community church and over where he would have us go. I'm saying this to you right now as a church. It says in verse three, I promise you what I promised Moses, wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you. And so we believe by faith today that that is the reason it's significant that we have a permanent location going at Suffolk. We believe by faith today that's the reason that we do local outreach all over Hampton Roads. We believe by faith today that's the reason we do international missions. Why? Because we believe that God said, I I am giving you the land. Now listen, I'm not talking about simply owning geographic land. I'm talking about going into areas and populations and bringing the people of those areas into the life God has for them. Like that is ultimately our purpose. And so God makes this promise to Joshua and he makes this promise of purpose and he makes the same kind of promise for you today if you would say yes to it. And then he goes just three verses down to Joshua and he says this, be strong and courageous. And if you're new to hearing me teach any of this, I want you to understand today that the only reason you would need to be strong and courageous is if you were gonna do something that would require you to have strength and courage. You know, as a dad, I, 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 like, I like my kids to do things that's like difficult for them. And I'll say like, come on, be brave. You got this. You can do it, come on, man. You know, I have never said to my kids when they lay on the couch to watch TV, be strong and courageous. <laughs> and if we're not careful, we'll want God to give us this great life when he only gives a great life through a life that requires strength and courage. Because he says, this is your plan, Joshua. This is your, the plan for my people. He says, be strong and courageous. He calls him out this way, and then he talks about everybody. You're the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore their ancestors to give them. Verse seven, be strong. And then he added the word very. Like, not only does he repeat it. Because it's one thing, like, you know, if you're mad at somebody, it's one thing to be mad, but it's a whole other thing to be very mad. <laughs> he goes, be strong and very courageous. 
And then he does the part right here in verse seven and eight to help all of us know, I believe, how to know we're facing forward, fulfill what God wants for our life. He says, be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. He says, take the word of God and like get it in your heart and obey what it says, being strong and courageous, and you will be successful in everything you do. There aren't many places you can go in life where they go, do this and you will be successful in everything you do, we promise. And God goes, look, this is it, just do this. So I'm like, great, we got verse six, be strong and courageous. Verse seven, be strong and very courageous. This is what you do, we're good to go. Then verse nine, he brings it out again. This is my command, okay. Be strong and courageous. Come on, Lord. Why do you gotta keep telling me to be strong and courageous? Because the fulfillment of God's purpose in his people in the earth isn't a one-time strength. It isn't a one-time courage. Faith isn't a one-time decision. Doing something big for God isn't like I did something once. No, this is a continuous life of strength. This is a continuous life of courage where it is daily. He says, do not be afraid or discouraged. Why? Because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So when you hear me get fired up about church and about life, I'm like this, because I believe this. But I've read my Bible, and what happened to this guy, Joshua, and God's people in the book of Joshua, is that after Joshua 1 happened, then really what happened was all hell started to break loose. And they had to actually find out that they needed strength and courage. Come on, if you're here today, and you've gone through a difficult time, there's a good chance you've wondered at times, God, why do I have to go through this? You ever ask yourself that question? Come on, lift your hands up right now. Suffolk Campus, Western Branch, you ever, why, why, why is, come, come on, Lord. I mean, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm not as bad as that guy. <laughs> come on, you've thought it even if you've never said it. Maybe God's like, listen, I have so much that I am trying to line up in your life. And the question is, will you stay strong and courageous facing forward into what I have? Because most people shrink back. It's not, no, not us. Not us, community church. And I believe not you as individuals. So Joshua, he, he gets this promise. Then in Joshua chapter three, Verse five, Joshua comes to like the army and he's like, hey guys, listen up. The people, the whole, the whole nation, he's like, listen up. Consecrate yourself. Some translations, say, some translations say purify yourselves. Joshua chapter three, verse five. He said, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Don't y'all wish it was today? Sometimes the getting ready phase requires more faith than the going through phase. Sometimes the getting ready phase is the step of faith. Will you stay? Will you stay facing believing? Here, here's the thing I wanna tell you about Joshua saying this. He, he had the faith to say this because he had this ability to believe what he saw in what you might call spiritualized or, or you might call faith eyes. He, he did not see the miracle that was gonna happen tomorrow, the miracle that was gonna happen when he says this to the people is that they were gonna be led on dry ground. They were gonna cross a body of water and the water was literally gonna stand up tall like walls on both sides and the whole nation, like, right, they would walk through on dry ground. He saw that that was gonna happen before he told the people that was gonna happen. See, write this down. Before I say it, I see it in my mind. This is what faith is. Before I say it out of my mouth, I see it in my mind. This is how the scriptures say that, that God wants to show us things, to tell you things. You right now, you, you're here, you're a follower of Jesus Christ, simply a son or a daughter of Father God. He wants to show you things in your mind. And then part of our Obedience when he does that is to know, do I say it? Do I prophetically release this? I wanna tell you today that I think sometimes what happens is we say something, 
we didn't see, and that's foolish. To say it without seeing it is foolish. This isn't me up here going, yeah, just say a lot of great things. No, God actually got pretty mad about people that did that in the Old Testament. He's like, stop telling people all this good stuff's gonna happen because that's not what I said. No, to say it without seeing it is foolish, but on the other side, to see it without saying it is fearful. And that is why he told Joshua, be strong and courageous because one of the most important things you are gonna do as a leader, listen, you are a leader if you are a follower of Jesus Christ because we are called to lead people to know that Jesus has a plan and a purpose for their life, to bring them from mediocrity into living fully alive. You're a leader and to be a leader, we've gotta be willing sometimes to be so strong and courageous to declare what we know we should declare even though we're not sure how somebody's gonna respond. Be strong and courageous. So Joshua says, hey, come on, let's go. And so everybody gets ready, and that next morning they get up. The Bible says in verse, or in, in Joshua chapter three, it continues on, and it says he gets ready, and they get up from camp, and, and, and they're gonna go cross the water, and, and the priests are leading the way, and they, they walk out into the water, and the water starts to split up, and it says this is what happened. They stopped, and they stood in the middle of the body of water while everybody else crossed on dry land. Now, before I go any further into this part, I want you to understand this, this is a miracle and it actually happened. And if you do study the book of Joshua, I think that you, it would be so great for your life. What you'll find out is after this happened, there was just another battle. <laughs> and then after this happened, there was another battle. And they literally marched around a city, Joshua chapter six called Jericho, caused the walls to fall down, caused them to take the city. And then after that, there's another battle. I'm like, I'm just, I'm just preferring the life where I fight one time. And then it's like smooth sailing. <laughs> Facing forward, and what Joshua taught, taught us, what God taught us through Joshua, I believe, was this picture. It says, they stood, the priests stood in the middle, and they kept standing in the middle until everybody had crossed. The miracle wasn't on the side before they got into the water. The miracle wasn't on the other side after they crossed the water. The miracle was in the middle. Miracles happen in the middle. So many of us here today, we just want to get there and say, look what God did. But God's going, no, face that direction so that you're moving that way, but watch for the miracles in the middle. Watch for the miracles that actually build your faith in the middle. Those small things. Watch for the miracles that you're not sure how they happened. But that's me showing you that you're on the right path. You're moving the right direction. Miracles in the middle, because right now we are literally just in this thing called the middle. We were born and then we're gonna die. Sorry. We're in the middle. We're in the middle. God has miracles in the middle, but, but guess what? Let me just speak to a vision for our church for a moment. This is why we believe it's so significant to have campuses all over Hampton Roads. This is why we believe God has called us to this is because we wanna be able to be in the middle of other people's lives. We wanna be able to meet people in the middle of what's going on and show them the miracle God has for them. We wanna be there to make a difference and to see people come alive. That's why we're here as a church. I'd love for you to watch this video of Erin and her story. Let's watch it. There was nothing that I could do by myself anymore. I couldn't do it by myself. My son was in fifth grade at the time, um, and he was being bullied at school, and I could see emotionally that he was just kind of shutting down. I could just see that he was broken in, in a way that it's just hard to see as a mother. So I went to community church and asked them to pray for me and my son. One of the men told me about the Saturday night service, so that was the very first service that we ever went to was on a Saturday night. For like a while, I feel like we were like the back row people, you know, late service, back row, just kind of like jumping in there. Um, and I was just glad that we were there. Like it, it felt good. But my husband grew up in a home that it wasn't, like religion was not a 
taught to him. So that was his first experience coming to church. And he even said, he was like, this is nice. I think it was the very first sisterhood. It was when we did Arise. Um, Pastor Megan messaged me on Instagram and I was making um, floral headpieces for my daughter's dance team. And she had messaged me and asked me if I would make flower crowns for sisterhood. So I said yes. And that was like the very first time I got involved in serving like even a little tiny bit, just like by making these crowns. But Pastor Megan, again, wanted me to help paint the murals that we hung up. And I was like, oh, like, what does this woman see in me that like I am not seeing in myself? So like she really encouraged me in those ways of getting me to serve in little small ways. It's been a huge transformation just for for like my son, for me and my husband and my daughters. But like as a family, it's been like there's been this total shift in everything. So like before we would just, you know, like we were just coming to church, like we would go to church, but we weren't like fully like checked into the purpose of church. And now like four years later, I can see how all those little tiny things that we did, the little tiny steps that we took brought us to this point where we are serving the way that we're supposed to be serving. We are fully checked in now and we're truly like living the way that we should be living, that God has intended us to live. Walking through all the other doors, like getting involved in groups and in sisterhood and all the things, it was, I didn't know like what was going to happen. So now every Sunday when I open the doors for the people to walk in, like I do think about it like, well, do they know like what is on the other side of this? Like, do they know that by walking through these doors, like what, how is this going to change their life like in four years from now? Like what will their story be four years from now just because they came to church this day and walked through these doors? It just changes everything. Like it, it just, it's just so, like, it's just so good. It just changes all the things. I, I see this. I, I think about, I think about Aaron's story and, and the doors of, of, the, of the church being open for people to walk through. And what I do is I start to think about the water standing up. And I think about the people literally walking in because sometimes we just need to make sure people are ushered into what God has for their life. It really is why it's so significant for there to be local churches and for us to make a difference. And her story and your story, right, if you are plugged in, they are so similar because the story is when we plant in God's house, it does put us on the right path and on the right track so that we could live the life he has for us and help others do the same. So now let me ask you, do you know what you're like? Because I'm gonna tell you. That was my introduction, now it's time for the message. <laughs> Psalm 92 says, the godly will flourish like palm trees and grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon, for they are transplanted to the Lord's own house. They flourish in the courts of our God. Even in old age, they will still produce fruit. They will remain vital and green. Come on, I just wanna make sure if you have ever had the thought that maybe you're too old or that maybe God doesn't still have something for you. His declaration is that if you are breathing, I have full purpose for your life, vitality for your life. You're called to have influence and to make a difference in our world right now. Now, he says they will keep flourishing. Verse 15, they will declare the Lord is just. He is my rock and there is no evil in him. The Bible says this and God declares it this way. Let me tell you today, if you are transplanted, if you plant in the church, you are like a palm tree and a cedar of Lebanon. Now I've read this passage of scripture so many times, literally no joke, probably hundreds of times. And I'm like, sweet, God must like palm trees. I mean, I like palm trees. I feel like I'm on vacation. Every time I'm around, I'm like, come on, it's a palm tree. I put one in my office, so I was just like, good, I'm on vacation. No, just... <laughs> so I thought, you know, if God is telling me that I'm like something, if I plant in his house, I should find out what that thing is actually like. Do you know what's significant about a palm tree? Is when it is planted where it is supposed to be planted. It can withstand storms and winds. 
It can go through literal torture and hell and still stand right back up when that's over. If it's planted where it's supposed to be planted. See, you might go to your house afterwards and you could go plant the palm tree in your backyard, but there's a good chance it wouldn't be able to withstand those storms. Why? Because that's not where it's supposed to be planted. Humanity created by God in the image of God, we were created to plant in God's house so that we would be able to stay strong when the storms of life come. Now, we all know, right, if you're not planted where you're supposed to be planted and the storms of life come, you don't only have to hurt yourself, you end up hurting others. We live in this hurricane uh, world here, Hampton Roads, right? And we all, I mean, praise, praise God, let's just thank him that in 2020, our 2019, we haven't had to deal with, you know, a couple day power outage or anything like that. I'm like, come on, it's awesome. Uh, but what always happens when there is one of those storms is these trees that don't have strong soil is they end up falling over and causing damage that impacts other people. Now, when you're, when you're planted where God calls you to, you're strong. Then he says, you're like the cedars of Lebanon. Again, if you read the Bible and you just skip through these things, like so many of us do for years, we're like, okay, like cedar of Lebanon. It's great. What am I like? I'm like a palm tree and a cedar of Lebanon. And you start trying that. Maybe if your place of work, if you're around people that aren't Christian, be like, I'm like a palm tree and a cedar of Lebanon. Don't really do that because they'll be like, why are you so weird? Why are you so weird? So a cedar of Lebanon, I, I, I did a lot of research because I'm like, you know, I'm not super smart about trees and I wanted to really understand. Here, if I could sum it up for you, what I discovered, it's this, the cedars of Lebanon were the most famous trees in all of antiquity. They defined the economy of ancient Lebanon. God says, let me tell you what you're like. You define the economy. I don't know about you, but I like that. I like to think that the way God has intended his followers to live their life is that the economy wouldn't impact us. We would be the ones that define the economy. That we wouldn't be the ones that react to what's going on in the world, but instead we would be the ones that set the culture of what's going on. He says, this is what it's like when you plant so your strength, right? What's it a result of? Your soil, where are you planted? Your strength, my strength today, it's a result of our soil. What are you planted in? What are you planted in? Are you, are you planted in the church? And I wanna make sure I'm extremely clear in what I wanna say right here. If community church is not the church for you to plant in, that's okay, find a local church and plant. This doesn't say it has to be our church, but it does say it's got to be the church. We've got to plant. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We've got to plant and what does it mean to plant? Listen, to plant in the church, it means to get connected. It means to get involved. If you're a back row person, slide in, slide out, like Aaron was talking about in her story. Listen, we are glad that you are here, but let me tell you, the promise of what God has for your life doesn't come until we decide to plant. Until we decide to plant. Because here's the truth, people don't drift when they are planted. People don't drift when they are planted. And we, unfortunately, in 2019, I'm just, as a pastor, I watch it happen. I watch people, we, we, we don't reach our potential because we don't plant. And we'll go to this church for six months and then we'll go to this church for six months and then we'll go to this church for a year and then we'll go to this church for a year. And what happens is we just go, we, here's what happens is people go to a church somewhere for a while until that something happens that they don't like. Listen, if you can go to a church and you like absolutely everything that happens forever, then something's not really actually happening. I read a quote this morning, cracked me up, it said this, some people, some people say they don't go to church because church is full of hypocrites. To which the person responded, there's room for one more, come on. <laughs> like Jesus is perfect, none of the rest of us are. 
We're saying like, let's, 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 let's do what he said because he's the perfect one so that we would fulfill what he has for us. Let's plant, let's make a difference, let's help. Let's help people walk into destiny. Let's help people walk into purpose. Let's make sure that we are walking into purpose. Apostle Paul, he comes to Timothy, this young leader at the time, and he says to him in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, this is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. He said, Timothy, you need to stir yourself up. You need to stir your faith up. You need to stir your faith up. So if you're here today, you're a follower of Jesus. The Bible says as soon as you decide to become a follower of Jesus, Holy Spirit, who is God, came to live inside of you. But we could let him, God with us, could just be dormant if we're not careful. So Paul said, Timothy, you gotta stir that up. Now listen, I recognize this. Like I can, on a, on a, good, on a good weekend message, I can get you stir, some of you stirred up a little bit. Like I can, there's some preachers I like to hear, they can like stir me up. But the problem is, like once you walk out of the doors of the church or once you stop listening, you have to be able to stir yourself up. You have to be able to stir yourself up. He said, you gotta fan into flame, stir yourself up, why? Because what is in there? He says, here's what is in here. Not fear, not timidity, but power, love, and self-discipline. Like this is what is here, the makeup of me. What am I like? I'm like a palm tree that could literally go all the way down to the ground in a storm that feels like, oh, it could take me out. But because of the hand of God, I can stand back up and be strong and powerful. And what is in me is this spirit of power, not like overbearing power, power to make it through. What is in me is love, where we can love people, not because they earned it, but because God loves me and where I can be. Self-discipline, sound mind. But I gotta stir it up. You gotta stir your faith up. You say, come on, God, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I don't wanna just go through the motions. Nobody likes to go through the motions. But we like to be fired up about good stuff. But if we're not careful, it's easier to get fired up about bad stuff. No, we gotta fan into flames the good stuff. We gotta get stirred up about the things that God wants for our life. We gotta get stirred up about the things that we can't see with natural eyes, but by faith we believe that God does make dry ground through waterways. That we believe that God does have purpose for that family member or that friend who is just, you have not been able to get through to them, but God does still have purpose for them and it is gonna get repaired one day. We gotta have faith, come on, as a church, that God is desiring to see hundreds of thousands of people across Hampton Roads step out of a life of mediocrity into the life God has for them. But I've gotta get stirred for it and you've gotta get stirred for it. So I ask you to stand up with me, if you would, at Suffolk and at Western Branch. God said, be strong and courageous. He said, be strong and very courageous. And then he said, this is my command. <laughs> be strong and courageous. Come on, Lord. I'd rather just chill. I'd rather just chill sometimes. And I'm telling you right now what God would say to you is I have better purpose for you. I have more significance for you. And it's not that you have to have some certain title. It's not that you have to have some certain exact job. It, it, it's none of those things. It's that you would come alive to the fact that God is in you, that he is with you, and that he's called you to this life of faith that we would face forward so that we would see what he is doing and keep moving. 
So I wanna pray for you today. I wanna pray and believe that across our house this weekend, that our spirits would be stirred up, that our faith would be stirred up, that some of us, if we have been kind of living in the middle in frustration, believing the miracle was at the end, we would start believing for God to show us the miracle in the middle. Maybe some of us feel like that we are like that palm tree all the way down at the ground, and if we were honest, we don't really feel like we're gonna pop back up. We've kind of just reserved to the fact that I guess I'm just gonna have to kind of live like this and go through this. And I'm saying, God, no, I wanna be stirred up with fresh faith. I wanna be stirred up that that's not the destiny that you put on our life. And so if you're here today and you'd say, you know what, I, I don't even know exactly how to pray it, but I want fresh faith. I want I just want my spirit to be stirred up to the things of God. I wanna come alive. Then I'm just gonna ask you, you can hold your palms up like this. I'm gonna pray for you because I just believe God wants to pour into us here today. Fresh faith. God, I thank you so much, Lord, that you are the giver of all good things. Your word says that you're a good dad who loves to give good gifts to his kids. And so right now, Lord, across this room, palms up, men and women say, I wanna be stirred up with fresh faith today. I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, would you right now release fresh faith into these men and women? I'm asking in Jesus' name, Lord, where dreams have died, would you cause them to come back alive right now? Lord, right now where there has been a settling of this is just the way it's gonna have to be, God, would you break off that lie of deception and instead speak in right now, Holy Spirit, that there are better days ahead. The best is yet to come. Would you help us face forward right now in Jesus' name? Would you stir our faith? And I pray right now for every single man and woman with palms up, Lord, would you speak to them and show them how to stir up their spirit? how to stir up their faith, that when they walk out of this service in a few minutes, Lord, they would have a a fresh understanding of what is it that stirs me up for the things of God. I thank you for favor. And I thank you, God, that we would come alive fresh today. In Jesus' name, amen.